what is magnitude. So these, let's go on to this four commonly used terms. Magnitude, yeah, it's a standard calibrated measure of how bright a star is. And a, it conforms to a proper magnitude scale. In other words, it's not just something to make up, oh, that's about a 6 out of 10 brightness. Oh, no, it's an exact science. It's calibrated. It's got a proper scale. So the apparent magnitude is how bright it looks through your telescope <coughs> and look up at it. That bright, or that dim, or whatever. How it appears for you from Earth. And that's a function of actually how genuinely bright it is, the absolute magnitude, and how far away it is. Apparent magnitude, another term is brightness. How bright is that star? And that's properly worked out with a properly calibrated brightness scale. So the, ab absolute, the absolute magnitude, yeah, it's the brightness of the star, it's the sort of how actually genuinely it's intrinsic brightness, not how it looks from us. To standardize it, they've, they've, um, they put it the brightness of the star as seen from 10 parsecs. A parsec is a unit of uh, length, measurement of length in astronomy. A light year, you're probably familiar with the term light year, it's the distance light travels in a year, which is 10 million, million kilometers. So it's traveling at 300,000 um, meters per second. And a parsec is 3.26 light years. The astronomers is just, it's just a form of measure that they use for the parsec. So 10 parsecs, which is 32.6 light years, that really is the, is the standardized distance from a star, what its magnitude would be, and they call it the absolute magnitude. Can you come up here, mate? There's a kid down. Chris? <coughs> oh, yes, never. Just a like 300,000 kilometers. What did I say? Sorry, I think you said meters per second. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yes, yes. It's three times ten to the eight meters per second. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Three hundred thousand kilometers per second. That's how fast light travels. One second does about six laps of the Earth or something like that. <laughs> and given a year in a straight line, it'll go ten million million kilometers, and that's a light year. And you put 30, three point two six of those together, and you get a parsec. When we say an easy one to remember that it's about 500 seconds from the sun. Right, yes. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's about 8 minutes, isn't it? Eight, 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 minutes. 8 minutes, 20 seconds, roughly. The luminosity is the total out power output of a star, and that's per time. It's measured in joules per second, or watts. And that, as you'll see later, is a function of the star's size and a function of how hot it is. So let's have a look at this magnitude scale. <coughs> it looks a bit crazy, but there is some logic behind it. It's all created from historic reasons. But there's two main take-home messages here. The magnitude scale increases with faintness, or decreases with brightness, and is logarithmic. So let's have a look at that. So to standardize it, once again, they've just designated the star Vega, and they've called that zero magnitude. As you go up in magnitude, that implies the star is getting fainter. As you go down in magnitude, i.e. more negative, that implies the star is getting brighter. And how it all came about originally is a guy, um, Hipparchus, who looked up in the sky and looked at one of the brightest stars he could see. He said, I'm going to label that as a magnitude one star. He then looked in the sky at one of the faintest objects he could see. I'm going to label that as a magnitude six star. And then everything in between, I'll probably have a guess what it, what it, where it fits in amongst that lot. <coughs> so it so happens that with time, they worked it all out. And it so happens the difference in magnitude between a uh, uh, five, in other words, for example, the difference in magnitude between a magnitude one star and a magnitude six star, the difference in brightness is by a factor of 100. And you can see that here, here's Vega, that's zero, and that's 100% brightness, that's your, what it's calibrated against. You go down to a magnitude of 5, and it's only 1% or 100 for the brightness. So that's <coughs> how it works. So how about, what is the difference in magnitude, difference in brightness between a magnitude of, say, 2 and 3, or 3 and 4, and about 1 per go? And it's actually 2.512. And how on earth did they get that figure? It's just a fifth root of 100. That's how they get to it. So 
So if you, if you um, get the brightness of, of, say, 2, and you increase the brightness to the power of 2.512, you get a magnitude 3, and so on and so on. So it looks all a bit messy, but there is, it's for historical values. And the main thing to remember is, hey, Vega is the magnitude 0. Anything brighter than that gets more and more negative. Anything fainter gets more positive, and it's on a logarithmic scale. That's pretty much all you need to know. So where does this all fit some well-known stars and the moon and so on? So here's, here's Vega, that'll be there, about zero. The sun's really bright, it's the brightest thing in the sky, and it's about minus 26. The full moon is about minus 12 or thereabouts, so you can see the brighter you get, the more negative you get. Here's our friend Sirius, about minus 1.47 in magnitude. And remember, this is, this is apparent magnitude, what it looks like from us with our eye. Here's our make eye limit. How far can you see? To magnitude 6 is usually the limits of what we can see. The Hubble goes out to magnitudes up to about 28 or so. Grant, yeah, no, Chris, the um, Evans and Blackwell telescope, you can see visually the magnitude 13. Right, yeah, 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 four, yeah. Yeah, 14 about 20 years ago, but yes. about 13. Yes. Um, and with a camera, you can see down to minus 25. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a closer look at what we're talking about with Sirius. It's apparent magnitude, in other words, how bright it is in the sky for us to look at through the proper magnitude scale. A is minus 1.47. Sirius B is 8.44. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Sirius B was a little bit smaller, it's not very bright, so it's a much higher number. So that illustrates that quite nicely. The absolute magnitude, Sirius A, 1.42 and B is 11.18. Well, for starters, that makes sense. This number is the more faint one, it's bigger. But then part of the intuition says, well, hang on a minute. According to this, the absolute magnitude is, is weaker than the apparent. What does that tell you? What does that imply about the distance? It's under uh, the 3.26. Yeah, yeah, correct, under that 10 parsecs. Because oh, no. remember, the absolute magnitude absolutely is standardized as if you're standing at 10 parsecs away from, from the star. So most stars that we see, yes, the absolute magnitude is going to be a lot brighter, and we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing it fainter here. But when you see figures like that, you immediately know the distance. It's inside 10 parsecs, or 32, <coughs> 2, 6, like this. <coughs> so that's really the, the, uh, the main messages there, sort of the example and, and, and the implications. So how do we measure the distances to these stars? There are actually a lot of different methods. The big three is stellar parallax, which is a, a form of trigonometry. Variable stars, the whole talk in itself, but these particular stars pulsate. We're going to have a look at those. And we're going to briefly have a look at type 1a supernova, which also will be the subject of another talk. But let's get started. So stellar parallax. <coughs> The definition of a stellar parallax is it's the, the study and the making note of the changing position of a nearby star against some faraway background stars and measuring the shift when you go and measure it from a different position at a known distance. So you measure this nearby star against these background stars and what astronomers do You've got a known distance, you orbit around the Earth. So, say in June, they, they make a note of where it is in the sky. In June, sorry, in December, six months later, they have another look at that particular star and they say it's appeared to have moved over here. They know the distance in between here, and I'll show you in a minute how they work out this particular distance. Now, if you yourself can quite happily demonstrate the parallax method, if you hold a finger out, which you can do now if you like or whatever, but if you hold a finger out at arm's length, close one eye and just make a note of where it is against the backdrop of the far part of the wall of the room. Now, thick eyes, swap your eyes over and notice it's in a different position against the background. Exactly the same principle, except your left eye is June and your right eye December or the other way around. But you can see it. Can you do that? Yes. Yeah. Now, while you're doing that, just keep your eyes open or whatever, it doesn't matter. 
bring your finger much closer up towards your nose and repeat that experiment. And you notice the displacement's a lot more? Yeah, because the angle's changed. So you're already getting a feel, the principle, that things, nearby things, the angle changes against the background, and the closer something is, the more it moves. So if you can start working out the angular size of which it moves, you can start working out the basic geometry of how far away that, that finger or star is. So you can show that one to your friends. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get invited back, so <laughs> <laughs> Well, I had to do apologise. Okay, so here's the form that they used. So the distance, once again, you've been introduced to the concept of parsecs. So that astronomers love using parsecs for things out of the solar system in the nearby galaxy. They use parsecs at all. So the distance in parsecs is equal to 1 over the parallax angle of a star in arc seconds. Okay, exactly. What's an arc second, you ask? You realise the sky is 360 degrees, so it's, it's 60 <coughs> right round. So you split that up into degrees. And to give you an idea how much is a degree in the sky, Full moon is about half a degree in the sky. So a degree is about yay big at arc length. So that's a degree. And then they split a degree into 60 arc minutes. And then each arc minute they split into 60 arc seconds. So you're going, yeah, exactly. And I'll be thinking, Jeepers, that's a pretty small sliver off the sky. And that's what these modern day instruments do. Absolutely. They can measure these. They actually go down to milli arc seconds, those the modern telescopes. So really, really right now. But my point being is that they can narrow Did you have a question over there? Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, what's an arc minute? Is arc minute faster or slower? Oh, okay. Yeah. Minutes and seconds. Yeah, you, know, you always think of those in time, and that's probably what you're thinking of. Yeah, you know, how many minutes is it going to take you to do something? They also use minutes and seconds, they're also used in mathematics. <coughs> Um, to explain angles, little wee slithers of angles, in, like for example in the sky, and that's what it's referring to here. What's, then what's arc minutes? Oh, because it's an arc, it's a, like an arc, the sky arc, it's like that. So it's a little slither of, of a segment of the sky. Hence the word arc. Good question, absolutely. So, so yeah, arc means looking at the sky, the angle, and they've just got minutes into seconds. And they just do that in maths, yeah, as opposed to time. A lot of mathematics do use radians, absolutely, but astronomy, they stick to the arc minutes and arc seconds. So, let's have a look. So, if you, um, if you get a particular distance, and I think I've got a slide here, here you go, here's Sirius A and B, they keep coming back. So the angle in here is what they measure when they look at this, they draw it up, their instruments, and they say that angle there is 380 milli arc seconds. And you're plugging that into that formula, it upside down into arc seconds, and it comes to 2.64 parsecs, which is there's your 8.611 light years. So the next question you might have, so that's how they do it, is the concept which you can illustrate at home. That's an example, it's a simple form that they use, and then you might say, how far is it? It's only near relatively nearby stars. Um, the Hipparchus satellite that was launched in 1989. That measures up to 1,600 light years, sort of accurately, which is about 1%, 1 to 2% of the uh, length of the Milky Way. And the Gaia satellite that was launched in 2013, that accurately can use the parallax method to get up to about 20,000 light years. Why? It's got more refined instruments. It can, it can measure discreetly more tiny little angles better than a previous satellite, and much better than than sort of yesteryear's instruments and far, far better than our eyes. So it gets more and more advanced. Just that guy is still operating, it's about halfway through its program. That year we'll have a catalog of a billion stars with really accurate parallax measurements and other things, crop motion. Yep. It's really groundbreaking, isn't it? It's yeah. amazing. Okay, so that's your parallax method for nearby stars. How about stars a little bit further out? And closer galaxies and stuff, you know, outside the Milky Way. We need another method, and there is another method. There are types of stars called pulse, pulsating stars, and it's a whole different talk, we'll talk about it, a lot of fun, and there's two particular groups of those pulsating <coughs> stars called Cephids and RR Lyrae, variable stars. 
And these particular two groups of stars pulsate at rates that correlate with their luminosity. And luminosity is a measure of how bright something is, its power output as we talk. So if you plot the period and days, the rates at which these particular types of variable stars pulsate, and you map them against luminosity, you get a nice little chart. So if you look up and identify one of these variable stars, and you say, yep, it's a long story, we'll talk about it on another session, that yep, that's a CP, or that's an RR Lyrae, you count, work out its period, is it cycling, recycling every five days, 10 days, that instantly tells you how bright it is. So you know how bright it is, you then know its absolute magnitude, which you calibrate back to 10 past X. You look through your telescope, you put your CCD imager on, get an accurate measurement of its apparent magnitude from here, through that calibrated magnitude system. And once you know how bright something is here, and how bright it looks to us, it makes sense you can look at its distance. You might say, oh, okay, how do they tell that? You tell it. The principle is the inverse square law, whereby light just spreads out in all directions. So if you increase your distance by a factor of two from a light source, it's two squared dimmer, which is it's a quarter. If you walk away, say, four, uh, a factor of four away from a light source, it's only going to be sixteenth as bright as someone else who's standing closer to it. So it's called the inverse square law, and that's just because light spreads out at a nice equal distance. That's your principle. But then we're dealing with this, this system, this magnitude system, which is all to do with logarithms and fainting, things get fainter so they get more positive and so on, and, and it's, it looks, a, it's not a mess, but it looks a mess when you first look at it. How on earth are we going to make any sense? So the clever people have come up with this called the distance modulus, just a name given to this formula. It comes in two forms, both work equally well, whereby D or R is the distance, and, uh, and once again, the astronomer's favourite mm. measurement, the parsec. You'll be tossing in your sleep at 2 in the morning. Parsec, parsec, 3.26 light years. So it's all about parsecs. It's a lovely distance they love to talk about. Little m is always your apparent magnitude. Big m is your absolute magnitude. And there's your formula there. So you just plug in your numbers of those formulas and you'll get R or D, depending on what book you're looking at. Any one of those two formulas and when I would use your distance in magnitudes, using magnitudes here. So, <laughs> yeah, what sort of range? They use the nearby, the galaxies close to us, Magellanic clouds, in fact this whole thing, um, Henrietta Leavitt was one of the famous astronomers who, um, in America who first discovered this whole concept, and she was doing it in a small Magellanic cloud, she discovered this. These are sort of satellite galaxies of the Milky Way you see up in the sky in summer night. Um, but for the other galaxies, Andromeda and so on, you use these seeker variables to actually work out about 29 megaparsec. And a megaparsec is a million parsecs. So remember, the gear was getting up to 26,000 odd light years. These guys can go up to about 29 megaparsecs. That's huge distance. 29 million parsecs. And you can, you can identify a secret variable because it's so bright, you can actually work it out from there. So, there are other methods again. They're just nearby galaxies. How about further, further, further away galaxies? And you can do it by another thing called type A supernova. You've probably all heard of a supernova explosion when a big star ends in life and goes woof. This is a particular type of supernova. Once again, we'll have a whole talk on that. Um, at the bottom line is, there's two stars in the binary system. One of them is a white dwarf. The other one is usually a big fat red giant. And the material from the big red giant accretes onto the white dwarf, as you see here. And a white dwarf, as we'll learn in future talks, anything greater than about 1.4 solar masses, and a solar mass being the mass of the sun, two times kilograms. So anything 1.4 times the mass of the sun, a white dwarf becomes unstable and blows itself up. And it's called 1A supernova. So, a one, so, you, so what happens when you see one of these 1A supernova goes off? And the other thing here is, yeah, I should mention, is it's a very standard explosion. It's not haphazard. 
It's not, oh, gee, but that was a big explosion. Gosh, I wonder how bright that was. That must have been a big one. No, 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 no. That is exact physics. The exact mass is roughly about 1.4 solar masses. The explosion is very predictable, and the intensity of the explosion is very predictable. When you see one of these go off in your spectroscope, you identify it as a 1A supernova, you immediately know how bright it is, i.e. its absolute magnitude. So what do you do? You get the telescope out, have a look through, get your CCD imager on, and actually measure how bright it is or its apparent magnitude. And from there, you get your